Cool. Hi, this is Barry, and welcome to the Simplicity Zen podcast. Today, my guest is Jamie Howell. Jamie began his practice with Joshua Sasaki in Mount Baldy in the late 70s, and eventually um, started studying with um, Michael Winger at San Francisco Zen Center in 1983 and was Shusho or head student in 2005. In 2011, Jamie was received Dharma entrustment from Michael Winger. And Dharma entrustment, for those who don't know, is um, kind of a, a flavor of Dharma transmission, but for lay people. Would, would you say that's inaccurate? Yeah, I, I, I used to use the words Dharma entrustment all the time, but I, I noticed that San Francisco Zen Center uses, officially uses lay entrustment. So mm-hmm. I'm a little more comfortable with that. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a similar um, recognition of mm-hmm. uh, a lay person as it would be for a priest. Similar, not quite. Have you ever been given any indication whether you're empowered to give lay entrustment to a, to a, another lay student? You know, I haven't really discussed it. I accepted my role from the very beginning as a gelding. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have given, I have three of my students have taken Jukai, mm-hmm. but uh, four actually. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I have handed them off to Rosalie Curtis or to Michael Wenger for the ceremony. And I've been a part of the ceremony, but mm-hmm. I haven't been the one that's actually been giving them the, been their preceptor. Mm-hmm. You know, for those who don't know, um, who are who listening to this, one way that Soto Zen is differs from Renzai or other, you know, or, or Chinese Zen is that the concept of um, precept transmission is tied up with Dharma transmission. They're considered, you know, you, you, I think during the uh, formal Dharma transmission ceremony, you, both aspects are uh, part of the ritual, you know, the, the, pre, the transmission of the precepts and the transmission of the, uh, the Dharma, you know, rec- you know, authority to teach. I think because of that, um, I think a lot of lay and trusted people are kind of in a weird, undefined um, kind of no man's zone where since they're not priests and they've not been transmitted the ability to ordain people, can they give, can they empower other people to teach? Where at Renzai, the ordination and permission to teach, you know, Rinka, I mean, Inca are totally separate and so uh, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the years going forward yeah yeah i know uh i know of two lay people that have gotten inca in the rinzai tradition mm-hmm. but they were also geldings and the buck stopped there yeah but in the soto tradition especially the shinru suzuki branching streams tradition uh the lay and trusted people are encouraged to teach and mm-hmm. even in some cases, uh, start Zen centers. Uh, Baron Bender started mm-hmm. the Berlin Zen Center as a lay and trusted person mm-hmm. and was subsequently ordained and given Dharma transmission strictly for the reasons of making it clear that he could have successors and could give Jukai. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... So uh, let's uh, maybe talk a little bit about your journey here. Um, so did you grow up in the barrier? No, no, I uh, I grew up half in West Texas and half in South America, Sao Paulo, Brazil, to be exact. Oh, really? Are, are you fluent in Portuguese? Uh, to the age of 12 years old, I'm not so good at talking. I tried to give a Dharma talk in Sao Paulo about five years ago in Portuguese and was so inarticulate that Ultimately, I called on a friend of mine to come up and translate it because uh, talking about terms that are beyond the uh, normal conversation of soccer and girls, uh, I'm sort of inept. Mm-hmm. Um, are you, is one of your parents or both your parents um, Brazilian? No, my father was a West Texas cotton ginner and farmer. Mm-hmm. And right after World War II, he was invited by a multinational agricultural company to go down to South America mm-hmm. and to build cotton gins and help modernize the cotton farming in there. And we moved there and stayed until I was 12. And uh, I still go down about every five years or so. I'm deeply uh, 
in love with the country and the people and the mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. Do you are? What's your opinion of black beans and rice? Oh, can't can't get enough. Feijoada, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my mom is um, Brazilian, so I, I had it pretty much. There's always a pot on the stove growing up for me. Oh, did, did, did you grow up? Uh, did you grow up speaking Portuguese? You know, uh, you know, my grandparents. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. They even lived with us for about a year um, when I was growing up. And so, with talking to her, you know, we had a way of communicating, and I think it was basically like one third Portuguese, one third English, and then one third words that I thought was Portuguese and she thought were English, what I think were really were kind of made up, you know? And so I understand, I understood some Portuguese, but as I've gotten older, I've just lost it. You know, mm -hmm. I've just, I've been really bad with languages to start with, you know? There's a wonderful Zen teacher in Sao Paulo named uh, Cohen, mm -hmm. C-O-E-N, uh, mm -hmm. who is a woman uh, who has a, a trajectory very similar to Shinru Suzuki's, but She's not Japanese, she's Brazilian all the way. Mm -hmm. you should, and she speaks fluent English and you should think about getting her on your list. I'd love to, that'd be great on many levels. Um, is this someone you know personally? Yeah, I'm, I'm friends with her, yeah. Yeah, and an, and an introduction would be fantastic, thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, so did you grow up religious at all? Was, was your family Christian or atheist? You know, my father was raised Methodist and my mm -hmm. mother was raised Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. But once we got to Brazil, there was very little church attending mm -hmm. done by my family and I and, um, and my sister. Mm -hmm. But uh, my father was greatly moved by the interior of Brazil, uh, heavy Catholicism, uh, fundamental Catholicism, parades and you know, all the stuff that you can imagine in rural Italy or rural Portugal or uh, carrying the parades of the saints on their shoulders and stuff. Mm. He was very moved by that and he converted to Catholicism and later in his life. And that was the first time we'd had any hint of his religious interests. Mm -hmm. did, what was your, what was, how did you see religion? Did you think about in terms of God and anything like that? Uh, it, it wasn't really present in my life. Um, uh, I I do remember when I, we moved back to Lubbock, I, I started attending First Methodist Church mm -hmm. to play on their basketball team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do remember uh, going to church on Sunday because we were told that that was, uh, we were, it was rumored among us boys, as teenage boys, that that was the very best uh, way to have an a, a interesting date. But to take the girls to church first, so we did. <laughs> but that was my the extent of my uh, embracement of mm -hmm. of uh, Protestantism. But be clear, Lubbock has, which is where I grew up and went to high school. Lubbock mm -hmm. has the highest churches per capita of any city, or did when I was growing up, of any small city in in the whole United States. So mm -hmm. it was omnipresent. Yeah, it was just part of the culture. Right. Part of the reality of life. Right. Uh, what were your teenage years like? Were you, sounds like you're athletic. Uh, no, I wasn't particularly athletic, but I loved it and I was very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't, I was always the worst player on the team and the second worst player on the team, but I was on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a better soccer player than I was anything else because I had played soccer since I was three or four years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they didn't have any soccer in West Texas in the late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed that. Uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed my time in Lubbock. And I'm still friends with probably 25 people from my high school days. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are, are, there's three people out of my high school class that have been studying Buddhism for most of their adult life. Mm -hmm. uh, the two members of the Flatlanders, Jimmy Dale Gilmore and Butch Hancock, and an artist named Jip Club, and all three of those people come to my koan class on Thursdays that I've invited you to. Interesting. <clears throat> so, would you, so it sounds like you know, with that many friendships, you're probably fairly gregarious and social as a teenager. Uh, I have, I've never been. Uh, 
uh, an introvert no yeah. yeah uh so what do you say overall your childhood and teenagers were happy ones did you have a lot of angst you know, more, well, more, my, i mean every teenager has some obviously but my father had a stroke at when i was 12 at three mm -hmm. strokes actually and he never completely recovered from those strokes mm -hmm. and subsequent to that my mother ran away with a rich Oklahoma oil man when I was 17. And mm -hmm. those two things were very, very shattering to, mm -hmm. to my, uh, my young teenagehood. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see my mother at all for 10 years or so after she left. So she just bailed. She just bailed. For, she took my sister and she offered to take me. But once I said no, I was a senior in high school at that point. And I didn't really want to leave my uh, nice, cozy scene that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see her again until I was married and uh, living not that far from her. Mm -hmm. And we began to reconcile. And by the end of her life, we were good friends again. But there was a, a blank there for about 10, 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Do you think these kind of like cataclysmic events do they steer you towards spirituality or did like how how would you say it affect your life in that respect well I, I became very rebellious i don't know what the origin of my rebellion was but uh, as jick said you were the first beatnik in lubbock um i uh began to read on the road and act like woody guthrie and played guitar and played five string banjo and uh went to the selma March and participated with uh, SNCC and SSOC SOC, which is the white version of SNCC. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, uh, you know, found in 18, 19, 20, I was found, always found in blue work shirts and Levi's and thinking that I was Woody Guthrie and the soon to be uh, recognized Bob Dylan. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I left Lubbock several times. I made several forays out of Lubbock to try to live in California or live in New York. And mm -hmm. each time I was chased back by the overwhelming uh, difficulty of a, of a kid from the middle of the part of the country trying to move to those cities without any money, without any friends. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, w were you aspiring to be a musician professionally? Um, Ultimately, that's what happened. I went to Austin uh, with a couple of friends of mine. We started a, a band. We were sponsored by Big Brother and the Holding Company and brought our band out to California in 1967 in the Summer of Love. Mm -hmm. I played the Avalon and the Matrix and many of the same places that other people did. And uh, mm -hmm. I was playing lead guitar by then. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the rest of the band went back to Texas and I had fallen in love. So I stayed, got into another band and through a series of three or four years, ended up good friends with many of the people in the airplane. Hmm. And we opened for them several times. Mm -hmm. What uh, did you, so did you live in the hate? We, we lived uh, at, at the, near the corner of Colin Fell, which is from three blocks off of, from Aiden Ashbury. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we lived right in the midst of it. So I imagine, given the context, maybe there was a little bit of exploration with psychedelics. Most of my exploration with psychedelics occurred before I came to San Francisco. I, mm -hmm. I remember uh, we drove from Lawrence, Kansas, to Chicago, Illinois, to take our first acid trip because nobody had any. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the bus with Kesey. Kesey came. Really? Yeah, Kesey came to Austin and he didn't have a full bus and he was doing an acid test at Rice University and staying at Larry McMurtry's house, the author of Last Picture Show and uh, Lonesome Dove. And he wanted to fill up the bus with hippies. So he got a bunch of us from Austin to join for the show. And we, uh, I lived on the bus for about two weeks before I was so disoriented that I called up and had a friend come picked me up in Houston and I went went back to Austin. Did you meet Neil Cassidy and Mountain Girl and the whole scene? Uh, 
I did meet Mountain Girl. I didn't. Uh, by that point, Ramrod was driving the bus. Oh, I didn't know he. I didn't realize he was a prankster. He was a prankster before he was the dead's uh, uh, road manager. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I think and he was the second road manager. What was was Neil around? Was Cassidy part of the scene? I never was met he? him. I yeah. never Neil. I don't remember what year he died, mm -hmm. but he died fairly young, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what year he died, but I never met him. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I think he would go back and forth to Mexico a lot. And I think, you know, of course, he passed away in Mexico. Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to interview. Um, um, oh, God. Um, uh, the Grateful Dead's publicist, uh, Dennis McNally. Oh, Dennis McNally. We're, we're good friends. Oh, great. Yeah. So I, I'm going to quiz him pretty deeply about Neil Cassidy. When, <laughs> when that comes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so did the dead go out and play that Chicago acid test, or was it another band? Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, I didn't go to the Chicago, was not with the dead, okay. Chicago was not with music, it was that mm -hmm. was totally with uh, a bunch of prankster type friends that I had mm -hmm. in Lawrence, and we couldn't get any acid in Lawrence or Kansas City, so we had a connection in Chicago, so we drove there. Um, my only connection with Kesey was that one trip from Austin to Houston and and essentially back, uh, mm -hmm. which lasted for two weeks or, and I only have still pictures of it. It was quite, quite heavy. And, yeah. you know, I took, I remember taking, uh, what, were, what, what were the, those uh, flower seeds that were so? Oh, um, uh, morning glory? Mor blue morning glory, so heavenly blues. Mm -hmm. I remember taking those in Lubbock, and that was probably the most in, intense psychedelic I ever took. I ate way too many of those. Yeah. Um, so I had an extensive uh, psychedelic background, but I don't think I took acid more than once or twice that summer and summer of love. I was more interested in um, music and female companionship. Mm -hmm. did, did the psychedelic experience, would you, were they just recreational, or did do you? Do you think they kind of veered into the spiritual or mystical for you? I think my uh, drug days were totally hedonistic. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that I had any, I don't think I had a, a philosophical bone in my body until mm -hmm. I was well into my journey with Sasaki Roshi. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Did, um, so when you're in the Bay Area, did you, I assume you saw the Grateful Dead play along with Airplane and all those guys? I remember seeing a, a great show at the at winter at, at the Fillmore. The the airplane headline, the dead played sec there were second headliners and Quicksilver Messenger Service opened. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing that mm -hmm. show. But to be frank, most of the time that uh the dead were playing in the Bay Area. We were working too. We were working some abysmal little small club in San Leandro or someplace, but we were working nevertheless. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't play with them once. I once played with the new riders at the Matrix. We opened for the new riders. And mm -hmm. after we after I became friends with the airplane, um, we opened for them a couple of times at the mm -hmm. carousel or the Fillmore. Mm -hmm. What well, um, you know, you know, you mentioned hedonism, and it, and it seems like, you know, even up to the days where I saw the Grateful Dead, you know, it seemed like there's a fulcrum around he hedonism and spirituality, kind of <laughs> went back and forth and kind of blended together. I mean, like, were you and your friends were you guys thinking in terms of? You said you didn't weren't very philosophical, but were you guys thinking in terms of? changing the world and opening your mind and all that kind of stuff or well i was originally very political uh, my years in, in brazil had opened me to the opened my heart to integration and and uh when i came back to lubbock which was really the deep south even though it was west texas mm -hmm. uh there were no black people in my high school and uh, I got suspended from school for writing a senior paper that uh, 
uh, espoused integration, which at the time was very mild, but still I got in trouble for it. How did they justify that? They didn't have to justify it. They just said this is not, not, uh, not symbolic of a Monterey High School young man. Wow. And to, to be frank, Lubbock is still very, very right wing. It's just changed racially. Uh, they're allowing, they, they look, overlook all kinds of stuff that would have gotten people in deep trouble before. But I still love Lubbock and I'm, you know, I go back to Lubbock every so often. I went there a couple of years ago and I would drive around at night looking at the houses with the refrigerators out on the front lawn on Avenue T and 23rd Street and and uh, the incredible Los Angelization of Lubbock. And when I could come in, my aunt would say, Jimmy, what are you doing out there, boy? And my 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 answer was, Alice, it's just as interesting to me as Florence, Italy. It's just lovely. I just love Lubbock. Mm -hmm. Um, so how, can you talk a little bit about how you discovered Buddhism or what was Buddhism the first kind of spiritual or religious kind of philosophy that you were aware of? Well, you know, there was a period, I remember reading Shogun on the beach with, uh, Girl Freiberg, who's, uh, was married to, uh, David Freiberg, the, the, bassist for Quicksilver and then Jefferson Starship mm -hmm. and uh, all of the airplane and, and uh, their staff were all uh, spending a holiday in Honolulu and we were all hanging out on the beach and Girl and I were reading Shogun together and from Shogun I developed a very deep interest in Japanese culture especially Japanese culture of the 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th centuries and when in the process of discovering that my J Japanophile interest, I discovered Rinzai Zen. Mm -hmm. And so when I was told that there was a Rinzai master at, in California teaching on the top of Mount Baldy, I thought, well, I can go there and learn something from him. And I did a little quick study of what happens. Mm -hmm. And I saw that I could sign up for a Sashin that was in about a week. Mm -hmm. I never sat a period of zazen before. Mm -hmm. I went and did a sashin with Sasaki Roshi and made it through. It was really quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first period of zazen, was the first period of that sashin. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and uh, but I was 34. I thought I could do anything, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, from that experience, I developed a deep, uh, long, I guess I was always there, a, a deep longing for, for the spirituality that was offered in meditation and through the, the teachings of, of Rinzai Zen. Mm -hmm. And did, uh, did, you, did you have uh, Dokusan with Sasaki? I had San, San Zen was four times a day in those days. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody described to you what Sanzen was like with Sasaki Roshi? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the people I've talked to, they they were with him when he was much older, so maybe it was different. No, it was probably the same. It was very short. Mm -hmm. You'd get a koan, and uh, you would when you it was your turn to go into the room, he would ring a little bell, mm -hmm. and you would go in, and you would say your koan. He'd ask you the answer. You'd present or say your answer. And mm -hmm. you would say yes or no, and he would ring the bell and you were gone. And that mm -hmm. would happen four times a day. And you longed for a longer conversation with him. So mm -hmm. when you got it right, or when you got it stupendously wrong, uh, you were totally on the wrong track, he would guide you back into the, into the right way. Um, but the, the incredible pushing in the Zendo, uh, and the pulling in the Sanzen room and the pushing and the pulling and you were always in the middle of a crisis because there was no no respite anywhere for you um, mm -hmm. was really profound and 
the more often that I did these sashims, the deeper my practice became. Mm -hmm. And so you, your practice would, was entirely with him. You would drive down there to practice with him. You didn't. I would fly. You'd fly, or, yeah, fly. Yeah, I'd and, fly to Ontario and drive, uh, rent a car, and drive up to Mount Baldy, and mm -hmm. drive back to to the airport and fly back to San Francisco. And I did probably an average of two sashims a year for five years, maybe three. Mm -hmm. Not an a three on a good year, two on a not so good year. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but I didn't practice at all in between. You're just like a bench sitter. I was just like uh, I just would go for sashim and and I wouldn't sit at all. And it was the the catalyst for me sitting all the time and going to San Francisco Zen Center, which I had already learned about uh, because I was sitting a lot and you know you people would talk and. And you heard about San Francisco Zen Center. The catalyst was my young, young oldest daughter being diagnosed with leukemia when she was three years old. Mm -hmm. And that was the real beginning of uh, my practice at San Francisco Zen Center. And the reason that I switched my practice from Mount Baldy to San Francisco Zen Center, because it was so accessible and I could go every morning and, uh, and I became very, very devout and went every day. I went every day to morning zazen. If you can imagine, my, I was, by that point, I was uh, selling real estate. Ultimately, I became a manager of, of uh, real estate, a sales manager. Mm -hmm. I was going to zazen every morning. I'd get up at 4.30. Be at, be at my place sitting at by 5 a.m. And often I had a Zendo roll, so I had to be there even earlier at 4.45 or, or so. I would sit until seven, come home, eat breakfast, drive my kids to school, go to work, coach soccer in the afternoon, mm -hmm. and then go back to the Zendo in the late afternoon. It's intense. Did on. Um when you started going there was Richard Baker was still the abbot? Richard, ba when I started going there, it was right in the period of Richard Baker being ousted. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what the turmoil was because I was a total newbie there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did hold myself apart for a long time because I considered myself a Sasaki Roshi student. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of crying and wailing in the, in the Zendo. And I used to think, wow, somebody's really having an intense experience. But it, it turned out later that they were all suffering from Baker Roshi's evidential, evidentiary be betrayal. Yeah. And so there, people would actually start bawling in the Zendo pretty frequently. I remember it twice. Yeah, I remember... The first session I ever sat was actually at San Francisco. I mean, I did a half day one and up in Humboldt, but my first session, and kind of like you, I had, you know, I did the half day, and then four months later, I did the seven day. And that was, you know, I went out with no sitting experience, basically. But I remember during that session uh, twice, and this would have been a lot later, this would have been like early 90s, people just crying like crazy. Think, and I'm thinking, like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, somebody's getting enlightened or or suffering. They sounded upset, actually. You know. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it, I mean, I think I realized, like, I think I even then I intuitively knew that somebody was touching some sort of deep trauma, you know, or something, you know. Yeah, I I sat next to a woman once, a shame, that um, ran out of the zendo crying when she heard the sound of the kusako across the room. Hmm. And she was so upset. I went to her and I asked her, well, what, what happened? And she said, it sounded like my father beating my brothers. Oh, God. And I just, you never know what comes up for people, right? So you got to give everybody a big hug. Mm -hmm. So when you showed up at um, San Francisco Zen Center, did, did, did the atmosphere seem much different than the Rinzai Sasaki Zen that you did? For, like, was it kind of it, whiplash for you at all? Or? It was night and day. Could, it was could, totally, totally different. And can you elaborate on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Well, 
sitting in Sashin with, with Sasaki Roshi and Amal Baldi, there was a very shorter periods, a lot of yelling, don't move. A lot of hitting with the Kasaku mm -hmm. indiscriminately. I remember uh, being hit really hard by a guy and I asked him, well, he hit the, he hit the whole time. He hit the whole time that I was on. Mm -hmm. And I asked him after the Sashin, why did you hit me so hard? He said, I didn't like the energy in the Zendo, so I just hit everybody on your time. And so uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of a tremendous pressure mm -hmm. in the Rinzai uh, style, or at least the style, the the Miyoshinji style of Sasaki Roshi, and mm -hmm. uh, it, with San Francisco Zen Center, it was like you had a, a place to relax and to be to get really deep with your zazen without people intruding mm -hmm. on your zazen. Mm -hmm. um, after my experience at San Francisco Zen Center for a few years, for a few years I, I did both. And mm -hmm. when I would do a sashin at, at Mount Baldy, I no longer sat with my koan during, during the periods of zazen. Mm -hmm. I would just sit shikantaza and when I went into the Sanzen room to answer my koan. That's the first time I had even considered my koan for some time. Mm -hmm. And I had a much better uh, relationship with Roshi and he accepted my answers more often. Interesting. He me along. Did you, um, so were you formally his student? Was there any sort of ceremony? You know, we presented incense or anything like that? Yeah, there there was an incense ceremony. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I don't remember what the ceremony was like mm -hmm. because it was uh, during my first sashin, and there was everything that I did was so incredibly different mm -hmm. uh, that I don't really remember the ceremony. But I do remember uh, giving five or ten dollars to the head monk for uh, the incense ceremony because I had to pay for the incense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was some ceremony that I did and I must have done it with Sasaki Roshi in the Sanzen room. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, you know, he was very wonderful. I, I, I had a, I thought he was patient. I thought he would, he pulled me out of this world where I saw everything as an object. Mm -hmm. And he pulled me into this whole new way of looking at at the world and he did it quickly and he did it profoundly mm -hmm. um and then i was able to deepen that practice at san francisco zen center mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the two worked worked very well together for me mm -hmm. i don't know if they work so well together for others was there any whisperings of his um indiscretions with women well not while i not while i was there mm -hmm. um I was strictly come in on Friday. Sashin started on Saturday, leave the following Friday so in the evening as soon as the last period was over. So mm -hmm. I never really had a friend there, a relationship with anybody there. Mm -hmm. I saw people that over and over again, but I never really had a conversation with anybody. So mm -hmm. I didn't know anything, but uh, there was, a couple of people mentioned it to me at San Francisco Zen Center when I was doing both, as there was something going on. Mm -hmm. And then much later, I became very close friends and I'm still very close friends with someone who was his attendant, a female. I see. Was his attendant for a long time. And she has, she's still quite affected by, uh, negatively affected by his, uh, advancements whatever they may be she never told me exactly what they were but whatever they were he hurt her deeply and and i'm i find it very difficult mm -hmm. to talk about it but that's that's true um that said he was a genuinely good teacher mm -hmm. uh, and i'm i still am grateful for his teaching uh, I don't know what 
seems to cause so many Japanese teachers that have come over here to not be able to keep their hands to themselves or their yeah. love lives to themselves. But over and over again, we've found Japanese teachers misbehaving with mm -hmm. women. And I think only Suzuki Roshi has absolutely no rumors about him. I can't think of yeah. anyone else that doesn't have any rumors. Yeah. You know, I mean, in fairness, it's a lot of American born teachers too have had issues. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I think part of it is, is, you know, a lot of people who get into Zen are kind of like, geeky introverts you know who you know and then all of a sudden you know you know so they didn't necessarily have like this social outlet and chance to date lots of women and stuff and then you know a lot of times you know they get into zen really young so they don't really have much personality development and then all of a sudden they're a teacher and they're a position of authority and you know and they have access to women i just you know i think there's just a real unbalanced psychological development there because of that and they just you know, they're, you know, like I really think a lot of teach, a lot of those guys, they really need to spend a year or two just working in a gas station before they start teaching, you know, just like kind of ground themselves in reality, you know. Yeah, that's a very astute uh, observation. And I also think that the nature of Zen practice itself, the meditative practice, opens your heart uh, to love and affection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's not so far, the Eros is not so far away from that, that fraternal yeah. love. That, mm -hmm. uh, and so the line sometimes fades. I know that I've sat in a sashin, seen a girl that I thought was attractive, mm -hmm. had an affair with her, got married, had children, gotten divorced, <laughs> and by the end of the, of the sashin, we're no longer even speaking to each other. <laughs> but this is all in my mind, you know? Yeah. Uh, I can see uh, following that pattern of wh what you described mm -hmm. of somebody who's a nerd acting on it. Yeah, yeah, and it, and also I think um, you know if you really think about you know you know there's you know tens of thousands of lines of um, you know traditional scriptures of what it means to be awakened and all that kind of stuff. But if you really kind of get to the bottom, you know, the core of it. You know what? What was the Buddha's great doubt? You know, he was he was existential, right? You know, like old age, sickness, and death, and his practice resolved that for him. And I think a lot of people they can be awake enough where that where they're kind of the existential, you know, drama has been resolved. You know, and they're at peace in that respect. But that doesn't mean you know, and and probably to the point you know where they're, you know, they can lead other people towards those same resolution but it doesn't mean that they're a balanced or even ethical person you know I, you know i think that's one reason the, the precepts are so important is you know the awakening you know resolving the great matter of life and death does not necessarily mean you're not a jerk you know in, mm -hmm. in your relationships with other people I mean, what, what do you think well i was thinking as you were describing it uh you know buddha was tempted by mara's daughters right mm -hmm. but but uh, so many of the stories of Buddha uh, imply that he had a very um, a very adventurous life with his wife and mm -hmm. with the concubines at his palace before he ran off. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's probably better that he that you have that sort of life and then you're you can walk away. You, you can walk away from the temptations much easier. Mm -hmm. People that have never been tempted before, mm -hmm. yeah. not so easy. Yeah. Um, when you, so w when you first showed up at um, San Francisco Zen Center, um, you know, a lot, you know, especially San Francisco Zen Center, you know, you can just show up and do Zazen and leave. You could go there for years and literally not talk to another person. Mm -hmm. Like, were you, did you go to any beginner classes? Did you form any friendships? Did you, or were you just showing up to sit and leave for a while? Or what, what was your kind of day-to-day -day experience there? Well, I think San Francisco Zen Center, especially in the 80s and 90s, had a reputation of being not very welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, on the other hand, am sort of a, a gregarious, 
uh, extrovert, as I already mentioned. And, mm -hmm. and so I began to make friends there pretty quickly. People mm -hmm. were almost, I would say people were off put by my friend friendliness. <laughs> What's uh, wrong with this guy? He's, he's nice. <laughs> yeah. He's talking to us. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, and it helped that I would, was uh, on the Doan row, that mm -hmm. I would go and, you know, uh, practice the bells and stuff. Come early, you have to yeah. stay late to put stuff away. And there was more opportunity to actually talk to people. And then I, I made a practice, and I did this for many years, of at least once a week taking a colleague or a friend or a newcomer out to lunch there. Mm -hmm. And I would just take, you know, I was making good money as first as a, a big time road manager and second as a, a real estate salesman. So I always paid. These people had no money. And I always like to go for sushi or for good Italian food. And I would just go and take people. And I really developed some wonderful, very meaningful friendships that started with lunches, but have gone on to be mm -hmm. lifetime friendships. That's great. And did you have any, did you go to Dokusan pretty early or were you just showing up to set for a while? No, no. I, since I had had experience with, with, uh, with Dokusan, I wanted a teacher. And mm -hmm. so I asked uh, in the office, I went to the office, I said, you know, I've been sitting here for a couple of months and uh, I'd like to meet with the teacher and I'd like it to be a layman. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Uh, and uh, I was assigned to, uh, to somebody and within three or four weeks, we met three or four times. Michael Sawyer was his name, mm -hmm. a very good guy, but he moved to Green Gulch and okay. he passed me on to Michael Wanger. And from the very beginning, Michael and Wanger and I were a great fit. Um, Michael Wanger is a priest though, right? Or was he just a layman? He at was the, a layman. He, in at fact, the time, he was a layperson. When he became a priest, he uh, he came to me and, and we talked for a long time. And he, he said, well, if you'd really like to stay with a lay teacher, I can give you someone else that's a lay teacher. And mm -hmm. I said, no, by then I had a very deep relationship with Michael and wanted mm -hmm. to stay with Michael. So I did. Mm -hmm. And did... Um... What, what was he like as a person, as a teacher? I've never met him, so maybe you could paint a little bit of a picture of what his personality is like and what your first interactions were like. Well, he's, he's, a, a, he's a big guy. He's much, he's probably three or four inches taller than me and probably weighs 50, 60 pounds more. He's mm -hmm. a big guy. He uh, had played basketball in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, his son is a big guy and I watched his son play and, High school and I envisioned that Michael played a lot like him. He was a big post-up center. Um, and Michael was the dean of Buddhist studies. Mm -hmm. So he was the most intellectual, the most well-read, the most uh, yeah, those those are my two adjectives or my two mm -hmm. descriptions. So he, he kept assigning me things to read, mm -hmm. which I had never I've never been a reader before of Zen. Now I have this huge library of stuff that mm -hmm. originally started out with Michael Wenger, starting mm -hmm. me off to read. And now I'm a big reader. But to that point, I had not been. And I didn't know anything about the, the way the Dharma was organized mm -hmm. intellectually. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's really helped me. I, I've become a profound, profoundly interested in koan study, uh, both. Rinzai and Dogen's koans. Uh, Dogen has a wonderful collection of 300 koans that mm -hmm. I've been, I will, will be the next book that I, I teach in my Thursday class. Mm -hmm. Did, um, so you went, you were motivated to go there by just being so distraught about your daughter, you know, such a tragic situation. Did, were you, did you feel relief? pretty quickly or did it take a while to develop or did it at all? You know, am I just assuming? Well, um, she got better and I got better, but there's no, there's no, you can't dodge suffering. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if you knew this, but 
uh, less than a year ago, my oldest child committed suicide. I did not know that. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, I went into a deep black hole. Thank you for your condolences. And I'm, uh, I went into a deep black hole over it. Um, and then one morning I, I uh, had this revelation that if one of my students had had this happen to them, my advice would have been sit. Mm -hmm. And so I started sitting and I started sitting a lot. Uh, mm -hmm three hours a day, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoom is wonderful with all of its, you know, I can, you can sit with, start your morning with Brooklyn Zen Center at 4.15 and sit all the way to uh, Berkeley Zen Center at 8.30. Mm -hmm. um, so I started sitting a lot and I found that the sitting itself didn't cure the suffering, but made me, able to live with the suffering much easier. And that's, uh, that was true of my daughter's sickness as well. I was able to, to uh, live with the, the tragedy that, uh, that we all have as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, it, so this is, I almost feel ridiculous bringing it up because it doesn't, it's nothing like what you the experiences you have but one time i was driving down to um set a session with charlotte joe quebec down mm -hmm. in san diego i wonder oh, you're so lucky how was that oh she's you know as advertised <laughs> you know very deep very you know it's you know when you when you have dokus on with her you know it's just you know her eye you, know, you look at her eyes and there's just it's infinite you know <laughs> but um I mean, she she was the real deal. You know, she's she's often been criticized for being overly psychological, but you know, there's a real non-dual framework behind all of that that she teaches that maybe is not obvious. You know, her two books are very meaningful to me to this day. Yeah, I I I I, I, I uh, studied with one of her um, Dharma heirs, Diane Rosetta, for a number of years, and she said, I mean, that was the pivotal fulcrum in my life was, you know, working with Diane. So, I mean, it was, you know, this, that whole scene was pretty important to me, but, but anyway, um, so I was, so I was going down there and I think this is kind of, you know, before you had the internet on your phones or whatever, you know, it was in the nineties, I think, or I don't know, early two thousands, but, um, and I stopped by the, university library there and check my mail, you know, the day before the session. And this girl I was kind of sort of seeing or something, we were having all sorts of drama and she says, like, enough, you know, we need to stop talking to each other. And, you know, I was, was really um, connected to her. And I just would, I mean, it sounds silly, but I mean, maybe the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, just mm -hmm. you know, to be so, I was just so heartbroken. I mean, just, mm -hmm. I mean, just, it was intense suffering. And, and so the next day the sashins started and, um, and so I had to like sit with this intense pain, you know, just, it was very cute, you know, and I mean, and I feel stupid bringing it up because like compared to what you said, this is trivial, but I mean, but unfortunately I was very upset, you know, and, and I, and I remember during that sashin, like I couldn't make the pain go away so if I tried going away from it, it was worse. And if I tried going into it, it was worse. And so I just had to like neither let go or hold on, you know. Mm -hmm. you know, know. And, and it was, um, and I, you know, there was just a tremendous freedom there, you know. And it was it because was, it was so intense, and I couldn't hide from it. It was it was like a boot camp of suffering, you know. And um, sorry for making this about me, even though I'm interviewing you, but it just made me think about it. And and towards the end of it, I just, I really felt like a freedom, like I'd never felt in my life. And it was really interesting. Like after the session was over, this guy came over to me and I, and I didn't even notice him the whole session. He came, he gave me a hug. He's like, your strength was my pillar. <laughs> you know, like this apparently like, you know, like, you know, I just, I was so dialed in, you know, I must've been exuding something, you know? And, um, but yeah, and like that was kind of life-changing for me, honestly, you know, just like it, it, I realized that you can have pain, but not suffering, you know? But, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. You can, have, and you, you, it's, you have pain anyway. It's unavoidable. Suffering yeah. is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So you, um, it's, you know, one thing that you just said about some people that sit next to you and sit in or near you, I have always made it a, a, a policy not to give the people who sit next to me a hug at the end of such means. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I, I, I get the hell out of there. I'm like the opposite of you. <laughs> I, I fall in love with every one of them, male, female, it doesn't matter. They're all- That's great. They're, they're my Dharma brothers and sisters and they're just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it opens with your heart. That's awesome, that's great. Um, so did you do Jukai with Michael? I, you know, I, I have a funny story about Jukai. Um, very early on, uh, maybe in 1985, 86, I was offered the chance to start sewing. Mm -hmm. And I got a, I got the cloth and I got Michael. the cloth by Michael. Mm -hmm. I got a cloth and got started sewing. And um, almost 15 years later, mm -hmm. I still hadn't taken Jukai. Okay. And I don't know if uh, if I was not a joiner because I, I I still had some loyalties to Sasaki Roshi. I also had I just didn't know if I wanted to be in the inner sanctum, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that may be, whatever whatever delusion that whole process was, because strictly delusion. But I had some difficulties in in finding closing the deal to myself and. I remember a conversation in the hall up by the Kaisando, uh, Michael and Blanche and I, and uh, uh, Blanche Hartman, who, bless her soul, is a world leader, uh, mm -hmm. was a world leader of Zen. Um, mm -hmm. Michael said, have you finished your Rakasu? And I said, no, and, but I have it right here. And I was going to go to the sewing room and work it and work on it. And, she, and Blanche said, how You've taken 15 years to sew that rakasu. Give it to me. And she finished it and made me take Jukai. Oh. Yeah. And you did Jukai with him. And I did Jukai with Michael. That, mm -hmm. that, that was in the year 2000. And I took Jukai. And then I, uh, I remember, because I had never lived at Tassajara, and I've never lived in the building on Page Street, mm -hmm. uh, although I think I had shown that I was a pretty sincere practitioner, I had never had those two uh, presidential periods in my cap to point to. I did ask Michael, because I had seen a lot of my juniors becoming Shu So, uh, mm -hmm. I did ask Michael if I would ever be Shu So. And mm -hmm. Michael said, if you do a practice period at Tassajara, you'll be Shu So the next, uh, next proximate practice period. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's never going to happen because by that time, I was managing a, a large real estate company here. Mm -hmm. I had three children in private school, mm -hmm. a wife, uh, one child in public school, dogs, mortgages, cars, phone bills, you name it. I, there was no way that I could not take off for three months and expect mm -hmm. to have my family taken care of. So I dismissed it completely. And then two years later, uh, Michael, and I think Paul was there, Paul Howard, Paul, Paul, yeah, yeah uh, asked if I would be Shuso, and I, I said yes, and that was probably the happiest period of my life, aside from my honeymoon. Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoyed being Shuso. Yeah. And, yeah. Why, why do you think they waived their um, Tassahari requirement? You just, you just, you just stuck around? I just don't know. You know, I was also board chair of San Francisco Zen Center during that period. Oh, you were okay. Uh, yeah, so I was in the administration as well as, as well as in the practice side. I was a very busy boy. I don't know how it could have been so busy, but um, I don't know. And then when Michael uh, asked me if I would I was interested in lay entrustment, it was a similar scene. Um, Marsha Angus, who you may or may not know of, who's a, a fine Zen practitioner, a senior to me, and I were taken out to lunch by 
Mel Weitzman and Michael Wanger. And they asked if we wanted to, to become land trusted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marsha hemmed and hawed uh, because she wasn't sure that she wanted to become, didn't want to become a priest. Mm -hmm. And it was held out to her, and I think to me as well, that if we would ordain that we would get Dharma transmission in fairly short order. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more for her than for me. I don't know. I, I've never done short order or anything. Um, but uh, I wasn't interested in being a priest, and she was, and she actually started sewing her robes, I think, mm -hmm. but then she withdrew, and we both took lay entrustment. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what, um, what is that ceremony like at San Francisco Zen Center? Is, that, is, it, is it like the um, Chuso, where there's the midnight meetings and document transfers and all that kind of stuff? No, it's not as much stuff. Uh, it's a very nice ceremony. Uh, there's only five questioners, you know, at Chuseo Ceremony, there's a lot of questioners, mm -hmm. but the five questioners can go at you much deeper. They can ask the questions as long as you want. You don't have a stick to cut them off. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you sit on a high seat next to your teacher. So mm -hmm. you're, you're not... This you're is the not, entrustment ceremony. This is the entrustment ceremony. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... It's very, very nice. It's not that long. If you go on my Facebook page, you'll see pictures from the ceremony uh, there. Uh, okay. A lot of nicely taken pictures. You know, there hasn't been a lay entrustment ceremony since then hmm. at San Francisco Zen Center. Um, both the Berkeley Zen Center and the Everyday Zen group have been fairly good about ordaining their lay people, but uh, San Francisco Zen Center only has one candidate right now, and I don't know if, I don't know when she's going to take it. That's, uh, she's the current Tonto, and she's- Who? I'm sorry? Nancy Petron. Okay. She's the current Tonto, uh, and she's been Tonto with the Blue Rock Zoo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Is that, that's unprecedented probably, right? That's also unprecedented, yeah, she, and she deserves it. I mean, she, I, I think that she's she's gotten permission to, but the ceremony has never been scheduled because of the pandemic, and I'm not sure now she's going to be leaving Zen Center, so I'm not not sure that what what's going to happen with that. I hope she's her she teacher goes in and, and gets her delayed lay entrusted ceremony though. Who, who is her teacher? You know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm friends with her, but I don't know. So uh, your so your shoe show uh, practice period um, at San Francisco Zen Center. Do you guys do the thing where you have tea with all the participants in the practice period? And yes, yeah. So that was probably right up your alley then, right? I loved having tea with the students. Yeah, I even loved uh, wait, ringing the wake up bell. You know, mm -hmm. John King, who was a priest who since died, uh, mm -hmm. lives lived fairly close to me. Um, and he was such a good guy. He would make sure that I would get to the Zendo every morning. I think I had to be there at 4.30 to ring the wake-up bell. And he mm -hmm. came over, and at least half the days, he would come over and pick me up. And mm -hmm. he would take me, and he would stay until I'd finished cleaning the bathrooms in the Samu period. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he would bring me home. He was such a good friend, such a good guy. I really, really miss John. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, so your roles were to ring the ring, ring the wake up bell, have tea with the students. Uh, how often would you give a, a Dharma talk? Uh, I guess I must have given four Dharma mm -hmm. talks during a, a two month or three month period, once a month, let's say. Mm -hmm. And were um, participants, um, did they all do a, how's that? Did they all do a practice discussion with you, like a, a doku-san? No, they didn't all do a practice discussion with me. But that's interesting. You know, the first practice period that I did there was led by Reb, but mm -hmm. Pat Phelan was the shoe so. Mm -hmm. And I did a practice discussion with Pat Phelan. Do you know who she is? She's the head of the Chapel Hill Zen Center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, I know her. I've never met her. Uh, that practice discussion with Pat was the most 
educational practice discussion I've ever had about Zazen. Mm -hmm. She really was able to find the right language to communicate to me the right thing. And, you know, I was a relatively still beginner. I had only been sitting, say, for six years at the most at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and she was very, very good at honing in on what I needed to hear and, and helping me. Uh, subsequently, Paul Haller gave me another practice discussion on Zazen when I was kind of getting lost in the watcher, watching the watcher, watching the watcher. Uh, that was a, those were, both of them gave great, great practice discussions. And it was nice to be able to access people that were not just my main teacher. And it was nice that he encouraged me to see others. Mm -hmm. That is good. Um, since having uh, entrustment, do you, have you maintained your relationship with Michael? Do you guys still have practice discussions? Well, you know, Michael is on his 20th year of Parkinson's. I was, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. He had, I was his Chico in the early part of this century and mm -hmm. he was already suffering from Parkinson's then. Mm -hmm. Now it wasn't as obvious as it is now, but he's pretty, he's, he's having a lot of trouble and I don't really have to practice discussion with him anymore because he's, well, I don't know why. Maybe I should look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't, it's been several years, but I do visit him. Mm -hmm. uh, he has his own temple, uh, Dragon's Leap Temple at, mm -hmm. in the sunset. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a very nice Sangha. Uh, I have off and on taught out of there and my membership in the Lay Zen Teachers of America says Dragon's Leap Temple on it. Mm -hmm. um, I've taught both at San Francisco Zen Center and at Dragon's Leap as a practice instructor since I was lay entrusted, as well as uh, going down to South America and doing sashims with Monja Cohen. Do you have any uh, formal students? Uh, I tried to get rid of them. I, 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 I retired from Zen. I retired from everything after uh, the Rohatsu sashin of 2018. Mm -hmm. I was having, I'm, I have uh, a little bit of heart trouble and a lot of uh, arthritis. So I'm gonna be 77 in a few days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm all beat up from athletics and everything else. So mm -hmm. uh, I try to, ha I encourage my students to seek others, but I have maybe a half dozen that just won't go away. Okay. And you do your, you have the Thursday um, uh, uh, group, right? I have the Thursday group, that group is, Part. Some of those people are my students. Mm -hmm. Some of them are friends. Some of them come from Saturday Sangha, which is a group of lay people that that sit on Saturday or used to sit on Saturday at San Francisco Zen Center. Mm -hmm. um, it's about, the, I'd say the average people at each meeting is 15. There's probably a core group of 20 to 25 that, that, that belong to that group, though there's, they're on the email list. I guess mm -hmm. I should say that. Yeah. Um, um I, I, so you you mentioned you were um, on the board of directors of San Francisco Zen Center. Can I can I ask you kind of some sociological questions? Sure. Yeah. So um, I was being the geek that I am. I I was one time reading some board minutes from San Francisco Zen Center's board meeting, and one of the um, agenda items was one of the teachers. I think one of the abbots proposed a change to the um, the wording of one of the precepts. And it was voted on and accepted by the board. And that kind of blew my mind because that, because, you know, a lot of the board is, you know, are lay people, you know, non-priests, not even teachers. And it, it just, I found it really interesting that there was a democratic, non-clerical approval step for the wording of a precept. It, I mean, do I understand that correctly? Did I read that right? Well, um, a couple of things I would probably want to clarify with you before. Mm -hmm. I, that was I was not on the board at that time. I was board okay. president chair for two years in the early 2000s. Yeah. And I was on the board for six years. Mm -hmm. um, when I was on the board, 
the board members were elected by the Sangha, by the membership. Mm -hmm. By the time, five years after I was off the board, the board members are essentially appointed and rubber stamped. When I was on the board, they ran more than two people for each position. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I ran, I only ran so that I could fill out the ballot for, for uh, I was convinced by the secretary at the time that we need you to be on the ballot because we need 12 people for six spots. Mm -hmm. And we have to have it twice as And so you won't win, don't worry. I, I, cause I didn't want to win cause I was busy as you mm -hmm. can, as I've already told you about. And mm -hmm. so um, she called me after the election and she said, I'm so sorry. And I said, <laughs> oh, it's fine. I didn't want to win, I'm glad. She said, no, I'm sorry, cause you won. You were the highest vote getter. Yeah. So I, you know, but so that point is, is that during that time, there were almost all the people that were elected to the board were people that either practiced or were priests or whatever. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, any proposal like that, 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 that is going to contain religious language is probably already approved by the elders council, which is the, the elders council brings the abbot to the board, for example, mm -hmm. it, this is our new, this is our nomination for the abbot vote. Yes. Or vote. No, it's an up or down vote. Mm -hmm. We don't get to choose between two people. So the elders council is the real religious power. I see. Um, the the board is the ultimate decision maker, especially about money. Mm -hmm. And then there's also an administrative side with the president, the vice president, et cetera, et cetera. It's very confusing. There's too many people, but they went to this ultimate democracy as a result, as of the Baker Roshi dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've often wondered how they get anything done at all mm -hmm. with so many different people holding tiny bits of power. Right. Um, so the other question I have is, could you explain but, to me what the different, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But I love San Francisco Zen Center. I'm yeah. gonna, you know, I, I, I love them so much that my wife and I are arguing over how much I can leave them in my estate, mm -hmm. but that's another story. Go ahead, sorry. No, that's great. Um, could you explain to me what the difference is between an abiding and a central habit and why the organization has both? <clears throat> I just don't get, I don't understand that. <clears throat> um, is, are those the only two terms that you know of? <laughs> yes, the abiding and the central abbot, I think is what they're called now, unless I'm yeah. mistaken. Uh, no, I don't know the difference. I mean, the 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 uh, central abbot, I think, is is the head the head of it all. Okay. Uh, I don't know if they're going to have two or three abbots ongoingly, or mm. if, you know, or maybe they might even go for four. They might have an abbot that's the head of the whole thing, and one for Tassahara, one for city center and one for uh green gulch but i think that they are trying to keep tasahara rotational yeah that's what i've heard yeah that's why i've heard the reason there isn't an abbot at tasahara because the other abbots go there you know and, and i think when an abbot shows up there's all this whole ceremony of them you know going through the gate and stuff and i think they wouldn't know how to deal with the, an abbot live there how do you deal with another abbot coming in and former abbots i mean yeah. paul howler was down there paul's not an abbot anymore but Mm -hmm. Paul was down there for a long time the last, because of the pandemic. I think he was there for almost a year mm -hmm. recently. So, you know, it's, uh, it's an ever evolving uh, governmental way of running things. I, I think as soon as they figure out one way, they have changed it and will do something else. Mm -hmm. But it's been working, I, I think, the biggest crisis that, that I see, and I'm not in government anymore, but the thing that upsets me the most is the, the, the ejection of our foreign students a few years ago that we've never really made a comeback from because some of those people had positions of great responsibility. Mm -hmm. we, haven't, we haven't worked that out yet. Mm -hmm. 
I shouldn't say we, they, yeah. us, who knows? But well, I, I, I'm, I'm sad about that. We lost a lot of good people mm -hmm. and friends. Yeah. Um, object, they were rejected because they were trying to reduce population because of COVID? I, no, no, I think that uh, this is my interpretation. You can probably get a real uh, answer from somebody who's really in the know, but I think the Trump or uh, the, the Trump administration became very, uh, started looking very seriously at religious studies, religious students I see. Uh, here on a student's thesis. Oh, that's horrible. So uh, something that had never been looked at before started being looked at under the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's not good. Okay, so, um, so we've kind of covered everything that I was hoping to cover. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we wrap up? No, I really appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm uh, thankful for your podcast and for your for your Facebook uh, for your yeah Facebook uh, no YouTube mm -hmm. site. Um, thank you very much. I think you're doing a great service with this. Oh, and, thank you. And uh, it's really appreciated. And I think that uh, if you want to get a hold of me, and I have many suggestions of people that you should interview. So yeah, that'd be great. We should talk off camera sometime and. Okay. Uh, I'll give you some suggestions. Great. But thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon.